Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. On iTunes, one word, Dwyer Boxing News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now to quote former U.S. President John F. Kennedy, the torch is being passed to a new generation. We need to look at these fighters in their mid-30s and we need to figure out what the future holds for them. We need to give our own prognosis. Now Floyd Mayweather, who's approaching his late 30s, has announced that he's going to retire from the sport after three more fights. Right? Three more fights. One of those fights we know is going to be against Marcus Maidana. Given that Floyd fights twice a year, right, in May and September, about a year from now, Floyd will be out of the sport, right? Barring something new, Mayweather, if he sticks to his word, and understand many have not, Right? Isn't that David Hay talking about coming out of retirement yet again? Didn't we hear that Ali was retiring and then suddenly he was in the ring against Larry Holmes and then suddenly he was in the ring against Trevor Burbeck? I remember Larry Holmes walking away from the sport. But of course Larry Holmes was back in the ring against Mike Tyson then Larry Holmes was back in the ring even after that in a few fights, right? Sugar Ray Leonard was actually an announcer announcing on a fight involving Hector Macho Camacho. At the end of the fight, Camacho came over to the side of the ring, started calling out Ray Leonard. Sadly, Ray Leonard ended up back in the ring with Hector Camacho. Right now, maybe Floyd is different. There are the Rocky Marcianos and the Lennox Lewises of the world who say, Hey, that's it for me, Gene Tunney, and they walk away and they stay away. But if Mayweather holds to his word and leaves the sport, right, understand that's going to open the door to a lot of jockeying to get to where Mayweather was by the guys at 147 pounds. Now let's talk about the prognosis for Manny Pacquiao. I'm always concerned. Always concerned. When a fighter has some financial issues and he's in his mid-30s. Right? The reason for the concern as a gambler is I wonder whether the fighter is still fighting because he loves the sport and has the talent to compete at the highest levels or whether he's taking these fights simply for a payday right now Manny Pacquiao has had a tax problem don't believe me what you should do is Google the tax problem Depending on who you believe, this tax problem might be worth several million dollars. Right? It's the kind of thing that you need to be aware of, especially given the width of Manny Pacquiao's interests outside of the ring. Right? We know Manny Pacquiao is very interested in politics. Right? He's been a congressman in the Philippines. We know Manny Pacquiao is very interested in basketball. According to insiders, basketball might actually be his best sport. Right? Manny Pacquiao is a guy who is interested in singing. He's released records where he's singing songs and stuff like that. When you see a renaissance guy like this, a guy who clearly, you know, has a life away from boxing. Right? Pacquiao is a different personality type. That is Floyd Mayweather, right? Mayweather prides himself on saying no one works harder than he does. 
With Manny Pacquiao, we hear guys like Freddie Roach wondering where the next camp will be. Right? You know, Freddie sometimes has to travel to train Manny in remote locations. Right? Pacquiao strikes me as a guy who happens to be brilliant in boxing. But boxing doesn't seem to be his calling. Right? In many ways, he's like Vitaly Klitschko, who's now out of the sport of boxing. Right? So, you should always question Manny Pacquiao's desire. But the one thing that should not be questioned is Manny Pacquiao's hand speed. It's blinding. Manny Pacquiao's foot speed. It's blinding. Right? Gamblers, casinos have made Manny Pacquiao a huge favorite over Chris Algieri, who has great legs. Algieri's legs are among the best in boxing. They are. But they're not Manny Pacquiao's legs, even Pacquiao in his mid-30s. Right? I'm expecting Manny Pacquiao to beat Chris Algieri. Right? I've said so in an earlier video. Right, I think Pacquiao simply moves too well as a southpaw is going to present too many different angles, is hard to hit with the jab, has the hand speed advantage on Chris Algieri who isn't bad in the hand speed area. Right, I just think Manny Pacquiao has too much talent for Chris Algieri. Right? Now let's look deeper at Pacquiao. Understand that fight against Brandon Rios was not that close. Right? Pacquiao was dominant. In the rematch against Timothy Bradley, after a rough start, Pacquiao pulled away. Right? Pacquiao is still world class to the point where he can pull away from Timothy Bradley. I understand Bradley was hurt. But let's just say Pacquiao still has the talent to close the deal. Right? Now let me say this. His trainer, Freddie Roach, wants Manny Pacquiao to drop down in weight. Understand there is a problem at 147 pounds. If you're looking for a flash mob where a lot of talented guys suddenly find themselves in the same division, a lot of talented guys in their prime, what I want you to do is to look at 147 pounds, right? The guys ruling the roost right now at 147 pounds, in my opinion, would give Manny Pacquiao problems. Let's name them. One of them is a guy who sparred with Manny Pacquiao, Amir Khan, right? Khan is not going to be that phased by Manny Pacquiao's hand speed, in part because Amir Khan has seen Manny Pacquiao's hand speed. Khan used to train with Manny Pacquiao when both of them were with Freddie Roach. Let me also point out, too, that Amir Khan has some of the fastest hands in the sport of boxing himself. Right? That would be a hand speed fest if Khan were to fight Manny Pacquiao. Right? Understand, too, that Amir Khan, when he's thinking in the ring, and sometimes he's not, right? And I'm talking about the Danny Garcia fight, where Khan gives up his foot speed. I'm talking about the Lamont Peterson fight. What are you doing up on the ropes against Lamont Peterson? Right? But when Amir Khan is in the ring thinking, Amir Khan has great foot speed. And Amir Khan has length that Manny Pacquiao doesn't have. Right? And Amir Khan can actually generate power throwing punches low. You saw the punch he threw that dropped Marcus Maidana. Right? And so I believe Amir Khan, due to familiarity, due to hand speed, that's on par with Manny Pacquiao's, 
due to foot speed, where he can move around the ring with Manny Pacquiao. Due to power, wasn't that Cobb overpowering Zab Judah? Right, I think Amir Khan gives Manny Pacquiao a hard time. I think Cal Brook gives Manny Pacquiao a hard time. Cal Brook has great legs. Now let me point out, this is boxing, not the rest of the world. Somehow in boxing, we hear that a guy with great legs gets stabbed in the leg. And we all shrug. Then we hear he's going to miss his next fight, a blockbuster in Sheffield, his hometown. And boxing fans say, oh, okay, he'll be back, he'll be back. Could you imagine this attitude in the rest of life? Could you imagine hearing that Tom Brady's been stabbed in the leg and he's going to miss the Super Bowl and we're all shrugging saying, oh, it's okay, Tom will be back. Well, so it is in boxing. But assuming Cal Brook is still Cal Brook, assuming that stabbing isn't serious, and that's a huge assumption, you need to do your homework and find out exactly how bad the injuries are. Right? But assuming that that stabbing Right, and only in boxing do we use paragraphs like this. Assuming that that stabbing isn't that bad and Kell Brook is still Kell Brook, understand Kell Brook is an offensive juggernaut. Now, he was dealing with a hyper-aggressive Sean Porter in his last fight, and Porter himself has above-average foot speed. So it didn't really show itself that much. But understand, Kell Brook is blessed with great legs. Right, he has great legs. You notice it in fights like the Matthew Hatton fight. Kell Brook can move with Manny Pacquiao. Kell Brook hits hard. Don't be fooled by the Sean Porter fight going the distance. Kell Brook hits hard. Kell Brook has hand speed. Kell Brook to me is a bad matchup for Manny Pacquiao. Keith Thurman, Mr. One Touch or One Time, whatever the Whatever the tagline is, huge power and he moves. Right? Look at the Jean Zavek fight. He's on his back foot in that fight. Moving. He can move. I think Keith Thurman's a tough matchup for Manny Pacquiao. Right? The problem, too, with Manny Pacquiao at 147 pounds is that he doesn't have the power at 147 that he had at 135 and 140 right you may recall he knocks out Ricky Hatton at 140 we haven't seen that power at 147 right a bet I've been pushing here online for fights for years has been highly successful right and you know, taking the over in Manny Pacquiao fights at 147, hedged against his opponent winning by KO. Right? Both Bradley fights went the distance. The Rios fight went the distance. Both Marquez fights paid off on that prop. Right? One fight, and I'm talking about the last two fights. One fight goes a distance, the other fight the opponent wins by KO. The Shane Mosley fight goes a distance. The Antonio Margarito fight goes the distance. The Joshua Clotty fight goes the distance. The Miguel Cotto fight that Pacquiao wins by KO makes it into the 12th round. Right? Manny Pacquiao, if you go back through his history before 147, you're going to find out that guys didn't go the distance. You had blinding hand speed, blinding foot speed, one of the sport's best punches in Pacquiao's straight left hand, great timing, and you had guys getting stopped. Right? Pacquiao was a KO puncher. I encourage you to look at his career in the lower weight classes. So, Freddie Roach wants him to move down. Now, what I'm going to say is going to be controversial to many. Let's talk about two names at 140 pounds that have a bunch of hype around them 
who I feel Manny Pacquiao in his mid-30s beats. The first is, and I know I've been picking on this guy, and this guy did prove me wrong in his last fight, but the first guy is Danny Garcia. Garcia is unbeaten, but he's a mid-range hooker. Right? In other words, he's not that complicated an opponent. You know, Danny wants to literally take a step forward, bend his head, literally bend his head, look down, and throw hooks. That's his game. Right? You'll notice, you know, in the Rod Salka fight, he takes a step forward, he looks away, then he's throwing hooks. He'd have a hard time doing that against a guy who moves as well and who has the great timing that Manny Pacquiao has. Right? Manny Pacquiao's not going to stand around like Amir Khan did and try to trade with Danny Garcia. Foot speed would become an issue. Right? Garcia would have to move. Right? Pacquiao would know that Garcia needs to be mid-range to throw his hooks. Right? The biggest mistake Rod Salka made was after getting dropped, rather than just dust himself off and get back moving. Right? Push that fight to the middle rounds. Make his speed an issue. Unfortunately, Rod Salka in the macho sport of boxing got off the canvas, pounded his chest, motioned to Danny Garcia to, you know, let's have a shootout. And then, of course, shootouts are where Danny Garcia excels. Right? You saw Amir Khan. If Khan's on his back foot, moving around the ring, sticking a jab in Danny Garcia's face, that fight would have been compelling. I thought Khan won the first two rounds of that fight. But just like Rod Salka, right, I believe Khan drew a line in the sand, decided to duke it out with Danny Garcia. Guys with faster hands feel they can get there first. The problem is Garcia is throwing wide angle punches with bad intentions. And so if they hit, Right, And you don't know, there's an optical illusion with Danny Garcia where as he's throwing the punches, as it's coming, right, just like a pitcher with the same release point for a curveball and a fastball, you don't know whether that hook is coming up top or whether that hook is going to the body. The point is, if you're fighting Danny Garcia, you can't be in the pocket. You have to move around. The beauty of Manny Pacquiao's game is he doesn't have to be in the pocket. Right? That spacing is what Freddie Roach is accentuating right now with his other star pupil, the middleweight champion, Miguel Cotto. Right? So if Pacquiao's not in the pocket, against Danny Garcia, given that Pacquiao has faster hands. Forget the nicknames, forget the swift Danny Garcia. Pacquiao has the faster hands than Danny Garcia. If Pacquiao's out of the pocket against a mid-range hooker and has that mid-range hooker looking for him, that'll give Pacquiao an opportunity from distance to then step in and throw straight, and his punches are straight, straight left hands on Danny Garcia. I think Pacquiao beats Danny Garcia. Right? Understand though, there's an issue with Danny Garcia making weight at 140 pounds. That fight might have to be at a catch weight. Also, I believe, and let's call it as it is, whatever the height, I believe Manny Pacquiao beats Adrian Broner. The Broner, I've long complained here online that Broner doesn't move around the ring well enough. I've long complained. Look at some earlier videos I've done on Adrian Broner. Right? I believe Adrian Broner, with his wide stance, would be a sitting duck for Manny Pacquiao. 
I think Broner, and you remember, Broner had a problem with movement against Paulie Malinaji. Right? That fight went 12 rounds. I believe Broner would be having to talk to Manny and would have to be gesturing to Manny. Broner is a showman to come meet him in the pocket. Because I believe if you're outside the pocket on Adrian Broner, Broner is going to have problems finding you. Right? It would be a matter of Manny Pacquiao just landing a three-point shot. In other words, Manny would understand that Broner wouldn't be able to follow him. Right? So he'd be outside. He'd just be picking his entry point on when he can come in with some kind of looping punch to hurt Adrian Broner. I take Pacquiao today over Adrian Broner at 140 pounds. But let me say this, and here's where I'm going to really throw caution to the wind. I believe Manny Pacquiao has another route. Let me disagree with his trainer a little bit, and I understand this is dangerous for guys in their mid-30s. Right? He has another route. It's the Bernard Hopkins route. Let's look above him at 154 pounds. Now, Understand, Pacquiao's not knocking anyone out at 147. So when we get to 154 pounds, you have to assume that Manny Pacquiao is not going to knock anyone out there. Right? Out the gate, you would need to think in terms of overs if Pacquiao goes to 154. But I just don't see how a guy who really needs to be in the pocket to be successful in Saul Alvarez would cope with the speed and movement of Manny Pacquiao. Now I know this sounds preposterous, doesn't it? I mean, it's absolutely preposterous. But understand Saul Alvarez is talking about fighting Joshua Clotty next. A guy Manny Pacquiao already beat. Right, Manny Pacquiao at 154 is not only viable against Saul Alvarez, if Saul can still make 154. Pacquiao is not only viable against Saul Alvarez, and keep in mind Pacquiao held the belt at 154. But Manny Pacquiao is viable against Joshua Clotty. Let's go one step further. I know many of you are cringing. You're saying, hey, wait a moment. Wasn't Pacquiao weighing 150 when he won the belt at 154 against Antonio Margarito? Okay, fair enough. Right? But understand, back in the day, you didn't have to be the same weight as the guy you're fighting. Right? You've had guys fight for heavier titles not coming close to the weight limit of that heavier title. Right? Now you saw the problems Erislandy Lara gave Saul Alvarez outside of the pocket. Right? Understand too the height dynamic. You know, maybe an Amir Khan is much taller than Manny Pacquiao and has reach and knows how to use the reach. But understand that Manny Pacquiao and Saul Alvarez are almost the same height. They're almost the same height, folks. Right? The hand speed gap would be so jarring. I mean so jarring. That I believe judges would start writing in Pacquiao's name because it would look like, you know, Pacquiao has left the ring when Saul Alvarez is throwing punches. Right? I think if Manny Pacquiao won it, he could fight Saul Alvarez. He wouldn't have to come in at more than 150. I believe he beat Saul Alvarez. I believe that fight would be a box office bonanza. Let's also give Saul Alvarez credit. Right? Who fights more competition than Saul Alvarez? He's on the very short list. He belongs on that Zab Judah Carl Frotch Glenn Johnson list of guys who will fight anybody, right? Evander Holofield, if you want to go back a while. 
Think about it. This guy has fought. Right? Floyd Mayweather. Austin Trout. Erislandi Lara. Aren't these the guys people are trying to avoid? Didn't Saul Alvarez at one point commit to fighting James Kirkland and then Kirkland's the one who backed out? Right? Saul Alvarez is a guy who's fighting the guys everyone else is trying to avoid. Right? If Manny Pacquiao were to openly challenge Saul Alvarez, I'm telling you, Saul Alvarez would have a very hard time turning down that offer. I think that's a mega fight that needs to be explored further. I'll agree. Pacquiao's power hasn't translated to 147. He'd have to go into the Alvarez fight thinking about a decision. But let's get real. What I want people to do is to look at the film of Saul Alvarez against Miguel Cotto's older brother. Alvarez is almost taken out early in that fight. Right? It's conceivable that the hand speed gap would be such that Alvarez simply gets overwhelmed later in that fight. Let me go one step further. And here's where I know I'm really going to have people scratching their heads. 160. People are going to say Manny's too small for 160. A guy he beat, Miguel Cotto, a guy he knocked down multiple times in that fight has one of the belts at 160. Has one of the belts at 160. Now understand, KO punchers who are flat-footed, who walk around the ring, don't dance around the ring, who are pressure fighters trying to corner you, understand that is exactly the kind of fighter that Manny Pacquiao does best against. Think Ricky Hatton. That's a second round KO. Second round KO. You remember David Diaz was 135. That was a KO as well. Now I know he's unbeaten and I know he's big with fans right now. But he's also open to fast-handed counters. Right? Would Janady Golovkin get close enough to Manny Pacquiao to hurt him? Understand, Golovkin's flat-footed. Understand, Golovkin is throwing big punches. Golovkin's accustomed to being the hunter, not the hunted. Right? Understand, Manny Pacquiao can fight small. Understand, Manny Pacquiao has the gift of timing. Right? I would argue that you have a hand speed gap in that fight. I believe Manny Pacquiao would come out southpaw. Right? Tough angle. Right? I believe Golovkin would have a hard time hunting him down. Understand, Golovkin has had problems in some fights. Google the Kasim Uma Janady Golovkin fight. Right? Good luck cornering Pacquiao against the ropes. Like Golovkin cornered Daniel Gill. Think about it too. The body shot that dropped Matthew Macklin. When is the last time since Pacquiao is 5'6 and can fight small? When's the last time you saw Manny Pacquiao hit with a really good body shot? If Pacquiao bends and uses his height to his advantage, can he take away the body shot from Janady Golovkin? Understand too, 
One Manuel Marquez is a switch. Right? Marquez can actually lay traps, fight on his back foot, and have an aggressive fighter walk into punches. When is the last time you saw Janady Golovkin do that? Let me say too, Pacquiao doesn't have to get to 160 to fight for the belt at 160. Look at the weight at which Ray Robinson entered the ring for his fight against Joey Maxa. Right? Understand. You've had huge guys. Primo Carnera. You know, guys well over 200 pounds. As heavyweight champion since, you know, the 1930s. In fact, let's go back further. Jess Willard. Right? You've had these giant guys as heavyweight champion. Right? But understand. You've also had the Rocky Marcianos. The Joe Frazers as heavyweight champion, right? Because it's not the size of the guy in the ring. It's how the guy fights, right? Sometimes the hand speed, sometimes the angle, sometimes the timing actually gives a smaller guy like Jack Dempsey an opportunity. That Janady Golovkin, Manny Pacquiao fight, Golovkin would be a big favorite. Big favorite. I'd be rolling with Manny Pacquiao. Certainly prime Pacquiao would give Golovkin all he could handle. The question here would be, since father time beats all of us eventually, whether this Pacquiao is close to prime Pacquiao. So my prognosis for Manny Pacquiao is good. I think he has big fights, whether he goes up or down in weight. As I said, I think he beats Danny Garcia and Adrian Broner. Right? Understand, my concern with him losing weight at this stage in his career is that often when middle-aged fighters lose weight, they end up with disastrous results. Look at what happened to Chris Bird. Look at Eddie Chambers these days right those last few pounds are the hardest to lose and you have to ask yourself you know why would Pacquiao be fighting at 147 if he could effortlessly lose weight to get to 140 right I think that's hard I think even the best trained athletes Floyd Mayweather would have a hard time squeezing his body into the 140 pound division now. So my concern with Manny Pacquiao fighting at 140 is dehydration. It's not hand speed, it's not foot speed. I think he has both to beat the two guys I've named. Moving up, and I know it looks like I'm picking on Canelo and I'm picking on Janady Golovkin. But they have concrete styles. Understand I personally feel that Canelo lost to Eris Landy Lara. Right? I know I sound like a kook, but understand one of the judges agreed with me. Right? I personally feel that Canelo lost to Austin Trout. Right? You don't have to believe me. Look at the punch stat numbers. Rewatch that fight today. Boxing's an expectation game. Canelo exceeded expectations. Great. But he didn't do enough, in my opinion, to beat Austin Trout. So Canelo has been winning photo finishes, right? And Canelo is best in the pocket. He does have a straight right hand that extends out of the pocket. Okay, fair enough. But you saw how Eris Landy Lara was able to go 12 rounds against Saul Alvarez. You saw how movement constantly had Alvarez lifting his front foot. Right? And having to track down Erislandi Lara. Right? You didn't see any major punches landed by Saul Alvarez in that fight. Right? There's no Lara hits the canvas moments in that fight. Right? And so, my point to you is simply, right? Canelo has a problem with movement. 
Manny Pacquiao has great legs and has a decided hand speed advantage. If Pacquiao wanted to hunt bigger game, Saul Alvarez is right there. If he wants to really try to be Henry Armstrong-esque, I believe flat-footed Janady Golovkin gives him an opportunity at 160 pounds. Let's face it, he could also have a rematch with Miguel Cotto, although that's unlikely since both guys would want Freddie Roach in their corner. I get the feeling Cotto is one of these guys who values loyalty greatly and who would not fight Freddie Roach's other star pupil, Manny Pacquiao. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you if you feel the prognosis is dim. If you feel that, in fact, Pacquiao's at risk in his very next fight against Chris Algieri. Or if you feel that Garcia beats Pacquiao. Or Broner beats Pacquiao. Or Canelo beats Pacquiao. Or, and I understand most of you might feel this way, Janady Golovkin beats Pacquiao. I hope you'll leave those comments here in the comment section to this video. Let me hear from you. Let's talk boxing. Thanks for stopping by.